Hello and welcome to the Friday, October 4th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Zoners Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. A guest post today by one of our SANS EDU bachelor's degree interns goes over a tool that he wrote, Joshua Gilman. He wrote a tool called D-Shield Kickstarter. D-Shield Kickstarter is supposed to assist you with basically the next step after you have the basic honeypot installed. Our honeypot creates various logs and of course our main focus usually is sort of a little bit of set it and forget it setup where the logs are just being sent to our database. But in particular participants of the internship often like to have more detailed local log copies and in general more detailed logs than what we usually collect and report from the honeypot. And that's where the shield Kickstarter comes in. It assists you in configuring the honeypot to do things like keep packet captures and add a couple additional tools to help you process, for example, the rather extensive uh, curry logs. So if this is something that you would like to do as well, then uh, take a look at the shield Kickstarter. And if you have any feedback, please let Joshua know. In recent years, the abuse of cloud services, in particular these software as a service tools, has become uh, stable in the tool set used by many threat actors, including advanced persistent threat actors. And a virus company, ESET, now has the latest example, a group that they call Mustang Panda, which they believe is associated with China, used in its recent compromises, Pastebin, Dropbox, OneDrive, and GitHub. While Pastebin may be something that uh, would raise suspicion in some environments, Dropbox, OneDrive, very commonly used business tools, pretty much not blockable and difficult to sometimes find some anomalies here in all the traffic that you legitimately have uh, to these tools. GitHub in particular for developers, of course, a tool that's sort of indispensable. The one thing here reading uh, this article that may give you a hint that something wrong is going on is the frequency of the connections. In particular, the Dropbox tool they're using does update a file on Dropbox every 15 seconds. So uh, that may be sort of a beginning behavior or so that may raise some suspicion. But then again, you know, Dropbox itself, of course, keeps checking in uh, for updated files that it may need to synchronize and such. So by itself, this particular behavior may not necessarily raise an alert. The write-up is uh, quite detailed and definitely has uh, some hints here as to how to go about detecting this kind of activity. Don't just get stuck uh, looking for uh, the hashes and such that are quoted in the article. They have probably been changed by now. Look at uh, the overall behaviors that are being described in uh, this particular write-up. And I often mention vulnerabilities and how in particular when it comes to IoT devices, we often have basic issues like uh, buffer overflows and such that still uh, dominate these kind of devices. Well, so they're not just always complain about what's going wrong. There is also a nice blog post by Google what they are doing in order to improve the security of their Pixel phones, in particular when it comes uh, to the cellular modems or the baseband software that is essentially responsible for dealing with all of these different cellular protocols. The mitigation methods that they describe uh, mostly address things like buffer overflows, uh, stack canaries and such are being mentioned here, for example. But uh, this really sort of addresses the most dangerous group of uh, vulnerabilities that could be exploited without any user interaction just by receiving a crafted signal from some cell tower. 
And some of these techniques have been used in the past in some of the government-sponsored spyware that was used to attack various phones. In addition, uh, Google also made it easier to disable legacy cellular protocols, in particular 2G, which uh, for the most part, at least in the US and I believe in many other countries, has no longer been used, but can in some cases still be used by an attacker to downgrade the security of a phone connection. And talking about vulnerabilities, we do have two critical vulnerabilities in Optigo network switches. They're particularly used in OT, in manufacturing networks. And yes, again, very simple web application vulnerabilities. One is a PHP remote file inclusion vulnerability, allows the execution of code without authentication. The second one is an authentication bypass vulnerability that basically gives gives an attacker full access to the device without authentication. So this is it again for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for recommending this podcast and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.